Would you turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 8 while you're finding your place, say a few words. I want to um, tell you how much of a privilege it is for me to be here with you and I recognize that we have a broad range of students. I think that uh, you all come from uh, very different backgrounds and, and um, I believe the youngest here might be 12 or 13 and all the way up to 18 and then when you include counselors, uh, faculty, um, a broad range of ages and so I am um, attentive to the fact that uh, we have different, um, we come with different expectations and we have different um, backgrounds if you will and uh, so what I want to invite you to do this week is if you have questions about anything we talk about or if something doesn't make sense, you want to know more about it, um, I'll be here around campus. Um, you can guess that I'll be uh, not too far away from a place where you can get coffee. And um, if you just want to pull me aside and ask questions, uh, please don't hesitate to do that. Um, we'll be in Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 27. If you'll follow along with me as I read, I will read to the end of the chapter. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Well, yesterday night I told you that the theme of this week is the question of who Jesus is. It's a personal question that I put to you, one that in this passage Jesus put to, G uh, Peter, Jesus put to Peter, who do you say that I am? It's the question we'll be asking throughout the week as we look at different narratives in Mark's Gospel. This morning I want to add a couple questions to it. I want to add first this question. What does it mean to confess that Jesus is the Christ? And secondly, what does it mean to follow Him? So as we look at the passage, as we begin, what we see is that Jesus asks his disciples a question, not about what they think, but what do others say about who I am? And they answer that some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist. This might seem strange to those of you who know your Old Testament. You know that by this time Elijah had been dead many years, and John the Baptist had already been beheaded. But the prophet Malachi spoke of a day when God would send Elijah again. He says, before the great and awesome day of the Lord, I will send my prophet Elijah. And Herod, who executed John the Baptist, when he heard of Jesus, Matthew's Gospel tells us that he concluded that this was John the Baptist risen from the dead. So they looked at Jesus and they recognized that he was great, that he was unique that there was something different about him. But the problem with what all these other people were saying when they were looking at Jesus from afar was that they assigned to him a role that was less than who he is. When John the Baptist came on the scene, Mark 1 tells us that he said, he who comes after me is greater than me. 
So much so that John says, I'm not even unworthy. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal. So John looked at Jesus and recognized that his role was to prepare the way for the coming of the Christ. And yet these people look at Jesus and see him as only there to prepare the way for something else. But Jesus does not dwell on this. He turns the attention toward his disciples and he asks them, Who do you say that I am? And Peter immediately responds, You are the Christ. We live in a time and in a culture where it's fashionable to have any opinion about Jesus that's not the one found in Scripture. Many of you will go to college soon and perhaps you'll take a course where a professor will stand before you and will say things like, the resurrection is just a myth, it never happened. We'll tell you that Jesus was just a zealot, just a teacher. Maybe people with a more positive view of him will say he was a good moral teacher, but they all tend to put him on the same plane as people like Gandhi or Mother Teresa. And they fail to see that he's of an infinitely greater position than any human being. But his disciples did not make that mistake. They recognized that there was something that was different about Jesus than even from the prophets. And so they confessed, you are the Christ. But what we are about to find out, what we're about to discover, is that they did not fully comprehend what that meant. You see, immediately after Peter confesses, you are the Christ, Jesus charges them to tell no one, and he goes on to say that he must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Notice he doesn't say that I think this might happen. He says, this must happen. Why did Peter take him aside and rebuke him? Because Peter did not have a category in his mind for a Messiah who was going to suffer and die. You see, many of you drove here, at least if you landed in Buffalo or Rochester, you drove a short way here, and as you drove, you passed through some mountain ranges. If you're from the West Coast, you might disagree with that statement, but you pass through some, we'll call them hills. And when you were looking at those hills from a distance, they all looked like they were together, didn't they? If you looked at one mountain and another mountain peak, they looked like they were right next to each other. But then as you got into the mountain range, you saw that many miles separated them. Old Testament prophecy oftentimes is the same way. The same passage in the Old Testament can speak of Jesus as someone who's going to reign, someone who's glorious, someone who's going to reign in the way of his father David, who's going to restore Israel to its glory, in fact, a greater glory than it had ever known. But the same passage, as Isaiah 52 and 53 shows us, can speak of him as one who is wounded for our transgressions, who is crushed for our iniquity. It was very difficult for them to understand this. They didn't realize that these two things were separated by a long period of time. And at least in Peter's case, he focused on the glory, but he ignored the suffering. And why did he do that? Because his own ambition was attached to it. You see, Peter's one of his closest associates. And if Jesus is going to Jerusalem, to conquer the Romans, to take the throne, to become king. Well, Peter's thinking, what does that mean for me? He's going to be his right-hand man. But what does Jesus say to him when Peter rebukes him? Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. What a stunning rebuke. And yet, what Jesus is showing him is that what you're thinking, your agenda is not the agenda of God. It's not God's mission for me. You see, if we think of Christ as anything but our Savior who went to a cross, who suffered and died for us, and who God raised from the dead, then our view of Christ is less, less than what it should be. You see, what Peter needed to understand was that all, of the, all that would be encapsulated, all that would be captured, 
in reigning was of no value, of no worth, apart from Christ's death for our sins, apart from his work of atonement on the cross. And so what I'm challenging you to understand this morning and the conclusion that I hope that you'll come to when you ask yourself, who do I say that Jesus is? is to recognize that he's not just a good teacher and not just a great man, but that he's one who suffered and died for you. Well, what does that, how does that apply in our lives? What does that mean for us? Oftentimes, we look at Jesus as a kind of genie who gives us infinite wishes. We think that, I'll pray when I have a difficult test or perhaps a recital coming up. God will help me win this tennis match or get into the right college. And I'm not saying don't pray about those things. God tells us to cast all our cares upon Him, to come to Him for everything. But that, if that's our whole view, if that's all that we come to Him for, then what does that say about who we think He is? We might have the right words as Peter had, we might say, you are the Christ, but that just means that we think he's someone that's going to help us out of a difficult spot, a difficult situation. Jesus is going to show us in the passage that concludes uh, this chapter, he's going to show us what it means to follow him, the practical meaning of confessing that he is the Christ. If we believe that he came to suffer, to die, to rise again, and ultimately to be glorified, it ought to affect the way in which we live. And so, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The path of following Jesus is one of self-denial. End of taking up one's cross and following Jesus. Now, we're so familiar with the idea of the cross. We wear necklaces with crosses on them. We see them in our churches. We, we put them on t-shirts. It's so thoroughly familiar with us, to us, that we fail to appreciate how that would have sounded to Jesus' hearers. Because for them, the cross was like an electric chair. It was like saying, put a necklace around your neck with an electric chair on it, or a gallows, or a guillotine. To them it was not only a sign of execution, it was not only an execution reserved for the worst criminals, it was a sign of oppression by the Romans. It was their form of execution, and the Romans were the ones who oppressed the people of Israel. Not only this, but even in their own law, in the book of Leviticus, it says that cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree. And so anyone in their minds who was hung upon a cross was cursed. And yet Jesus tells them, if you would come after me, take up your cross and follow me. Now, we must distinguish between his cross and our cross. We are not saying that the way in which we carry our cross is the same way in which he carried his. You see, his going to the cross was for our sins. We can't do that for ourselves. We don't earn God's favor through suffering. We don't accomplish our salvation by carrying our cross, so to say. Only Christ could carry that cross. But what he calls us to do when he says, take up your cross and follow me, is to be willing to give up anything, even to the point of our own lives, for the sake of following him. We sang about it in our hymn this morning. Those were the words that came out of our mouth. Did you think about them? Did you consider them as we sang? What we were saying was that we are willing to give up everything for the sake of following Christ. He puts it this way, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Let me elaborate on that with his own words. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Do you see what Jesus is saying? Is that when you're confronted with a situation 
where you have to choose allegiance to Christ or allegiance to this world, you only have one choice before you. You cannot choose both. There is one that will save you and one choice that will mean you lose everything. And yet in the moment, it does not seem that way. Now, Jesus is not saying that every one of us will be confronted with a decision where we have to give our lives. The question is, if you are, what decision will you make? For many of us, we face quite different, lesser decisions. Suppose someday you face a situation where, by declaring your allegiance to Christ, you pass up a promotion at work, or bring it down to a school situation that friends will say, I don't want to hang with you. You're too much of a Christian. I don't like being around you. What do you choose? What decision do you make? What Jesus is telling us is that the better decision, the right decision, is to choose to follow him, regardless of the consequences. Because we cannot choose to serve two masters. We can't serve God and the world. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me, he says, and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So now Jesus is showing them that there is a separation he show, he, they've entered into the mountain range and now they're beginning to see that the mountain that represents Christ's glory, Christ's coming as king, that's still in the future. But what, where they are now is a mountain that represents Christ's suffering for them. He uses some interesting language here. He says that he is the son of man. Where does that come from? Why does he refer to himself as the Son of Man? Well, back then that could be a, a, a way of saying myself or I, but in a, in a humble way, if you refer to yourself in the third person, it'd be the same kind of thing. Or it could be a way of talking about just someone who's a human being. But I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. It's a reference to a passage in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, when Daniel saw a vision. And the vision that he saw he says, I saw one like a son of man. And the ancient of days gave him glory and power and dominion. This was one of those prophetic visions where Daniel was seeing Christ glorified. And he refers to him as one like a son of man. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's calling himself the son of man. And he, he warns his disciples, he warns the crowds who follow them, follow him. That if you are ashamed of me in this generation, then when I come, I will also be ashamed of you. It's a stunning warning, and yet it's one that we ought to take to heart. You see, Christ does not promise us, promise us a perfect life. We might think that we might have our whole life planned out before us. I'm sure some of you have figured out what college you want to go to, what you want to study. Perhaps you want to be the greatest concert violinist who ever lived. It's not wrong to, to try to be excellent at what you do. It's not wrong to pursue that kind of thing. But when it comes to that choice between your ambition and following Christ, the question is, what will you choose? Will you follow him? And that question depends on what we mean when we say of Jesus, you are the Christ. Do we mean that he's just a good teacher, someone who helps us along the way? Perhaps we even recognize the fact that he died, that he rose from the dead. No. What it must mean is that we understand that Jesus is the one who went to the cross for our sins, who rose from the dead to guarantee our eternal life, and the one who will return again and judge the living and the dead. If we don't truly believe in those things, if we don't truly believe that he will come again, then will we live 
as if it's so. Do you see? You see how what we confess about Christ affects the way in which we live. It determines everything about us. But it's not that we earn God's favor in the way in which we live. It's that we are so wholeheartedly committed to following this Jesus who loved us to the point of death on a cross that we would give up anything for him. So friends, I invite you this week as you consider this passage and as you read the Gospel of Mark for yourself as you find time to ask yourself that question as you encounter Jesus who do I say that he is? Let's pray. Father in heaven we are all sinners in need of a Savior. Not one of us has the ability to save ourselves but you, in your grace and love for us, sent your Son to die for us. We would have had a Christ like Peter, who would be a leader, who would restore our glory. But you sent us a Christ, the only one who could do that, who could give, bring us into glory, who died, who served. Lord, we pray that you would enable us to follow him, to follow his leading, and to trust him in all things. Pray for the students this week that, that you would uh, enable them to practice well and to learn to play their music in such a way that they seek to glorify you. May they do it with excellence and bring glory to your name. We thank you for all these good gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.